Next, uh, Dr. Lisa Lando Hedrick, the teaching fellow in the Divinity School and the College at the University of Chicago. Her current interest explores the relationship between Anglo-American theories of language, nature, and metaphysics. She is book review editor of the American Journal of Theology and Philosophy, the Journal of the Institute for American Religious and Philosophical Thought, and is the author of Whitehead and the Pittsburgh School, Preempting the Problem of Intentionality, 2021. A work, by the way, which I've read and enjoyed very much, and I recommend. Uh, Dr. Hedrick. Hello. Okay. So this paper is an attempt to revisit a question that I actually posed for myself in the epilogue to the work that uh, Timothy just referenced. Uh, it was a short epilogue that was, in a sense, saying that uh, this is not a call to conversion, right? Um, that Whitehead doesn't want you to believe him in the sense that he's given you the final picture of reality. So the work today, the, the title, it's meant to be sort of provocative, right? Was Whitehead telling the truth? Right? The alternative to that is not, was he lying? It's, in what sense was he telling the truth? What does it mean to do that, right? In what sense can we understand his uh, speculative philosophy as correct? Uh, clearly, I think that it is incredibly useful, right? But what sort of theory of truth uh, is he either implicitly or explicitly developing there, such that how would he defend the correctness, right, of his own system of thought. So by recursive analysis then, I mean thinking with Whitehead about Whitehead. More specifically, I mean assessing in what way his metaphysics is correct or corrective by his own measure. Did Whitehead understand himself to be telling the truth? If so, in what sense? This began as a paper about the world, right? So what it means to get reality or nature right. It became a paper about God, uh, and it resolved into a paper about neither. So Whitehead's metaphysical terminology lacked finality by his own admission. All systematic thought begins from presuppositions and depends upon some narrowness of selection among its notions. Philosophy's chief danger, as we all know he says, is narrowness of selection. And so its systematic thought can be successful only to the degree to which it avoids narrowness with respect to its ultimate notions. Such notions are serviceable to the achievement of philosophic truth to the extent that they capture presuppositions of language. So presuppositions of language and philosophical truth are Whitehead's terms. That means to say that they are not successful to the extent that they are clearly and distinctly corresponding to the facts. It's vagueness that can characterize depth of relevance, what I will later refer to in his technical terminology as importance, formal importance. So the proper test of a system of ideas could never be finality but only progress, so he says. But that progress is always asymptotic and therefore interminable. Asymptotic to what? Right? Whitehead does not talk about progress in terms of approximating a better description of reality, but in terms of a more adequate and applicable interpretation of experience. Adequacy is a characteristic of the system. Philosophic truth will always be limited by what he calls unexpressed presuppositions but that does not make the system wrong, only approximate or partial. But again, approximate in what sense? Abstraction is, quote, the universe in perspective, and perspectives are the, quote, dead abstractions of mere fact from the living importance of things felt. Here, perspective, I don't think should be understood in visualist terms. Whitehead is not talking about world views. It is more accurate, I think, to call perspectives worlds or actual worlds than world views in this context. Whitehead uses the term actual entity instead of sensible object 
precisely in order to free his notions, he says, quote, from participation in an epistemological theory as to sense perception. So we can only understand to the extent that we can abstract, but to abstract is to create perspective. So understanding is in principle only ever elliptical. The metaphor of the ellipse is no doubt lost on me in its full importance because I'm no mathematician as he was. But in my feeble effort to appreciate Whitehead's technical language, the following strikes me as illustrative. The movement of a circle within another circle, a larger circle, along the larger circle's circumference, if traced from the perspective of the center of the smaller circle, it creates an ellipse. We might imagine the smaller circle as the rational scheme of ideas, and the larger as representative of the communicable universe. The only one, he says mockingly in a footnote uh, about Kant, right, that he is concerned with. This is not a representation of reality, it is an illustration of the rationalist enterprise as I see him understanding it. It is not illustrative, therefore, of worldviews, but more like multiple worlds emoting the fundamental character of reality. It would be truer to say, if we were to use those terms, that it illustrates the reality of representation rather than the other way around. His non-representationalist assessment of his own scheme is evident in his response to positive critiques of metaphysics. Unfortunately for this sort of objection, he writes, quote, there are no brute self-contained matters of fact capable of being understood apart from interpretation as an element in a system. And that, quote, every scientific memoir of, in its record of the facts is shot through and through with interpretation. Vagueness or generality is valid to the extent that the process of its production entails strict adherence to what he calls the conditions for the success of imaginative construction. The proper method of generalization is what Whitehead calls rationalism, or the pursuit of rationalistic ideals, which he dubs coherence among primary notions and consistency among logical deductions. That there is a proper method by which generalization qua imaginative construction succeeds is of exceeding importance for appreciating Whitehead's positive account of constructivism as addressing, not creating, problems of nearness, which I'll come back to. Control generality gives us a new method of observation where what we are observing are the presuppositions of language that are otherwise obscured by their ubiquity. Languages are, quote, storehouses of human experience, he says, and exhibit a general character which cannot be noticed except when employed in a deliberate way. When Whitehead states that there are no self-contained facts, therefore, I understand him to be indicating how languages store experience. Not, that is, by recording the facts, but by constructing a conceptual matrix. And this matrix is a technical term I'll also come back to. Okay, so meaning, therefore, can only exist in relations between terms, and its meaning also exhibits that relationality. So it is this statement that facts are not self-contained uh, facts, right, that cannot be self-contained by in principle is really both a statement about itself and the meaning of that statement can only uh, really be fully understood by means of what it refers to beyond itself. I'll explain that. Definition for Whitehead is always relational. As he explains its formal sense in the Principia, quote, a definition is a declaration that a certain newly introduced symbol or combination of symbols is to mean the same as a certain other combination of symbols of which the meaning is already known, end quote. A definition is always expressed as relation between what he says, what is defined and that to which it is defined as meaning, between definiendum and definiens. In process and reality, we see this point, <clears throat> excuse me, in the idea that there are no self-contained facts because every proposition, 
qua proposal of a fact is definable only in terms of its systematic context in the actual world. Now, this seems like a slide between logical propositions and propositions as ontological categories. It's precisely this shifting that we see in uh, Whitehead's work, particularly in Process and Reality, that it is really perplexing to me. By trying to connect the work in the Principia and the work in Process and Reality, it might seem unauth unauthorized because it sounds a bit like a category mistake. Wasn't his quarrel with Bertrand Russell all about logic not mirroring reality? Yes, but this is kind of precisely my point. Whitehead's metaphysics isn't claiming to mirror reality either. He is schematizing to get somewhere, to resolve, to render conceivable. So this is something that I wanna uh, perhaps talk about in the comment section if possible. Um, why do we think it might be a category mistake? to talk about the propositions in the Percipia and the nature of their relations among one's, one another and those that he dubs as a category of existence in process and reality. Okay. The adequacy of expression of the final generalities of experience is the goal and not the beginning of metaphysics, precisely because determinateness implies a system and that system is only refinable through a process of explication. Metaphysics, as I understand Whitehead to think, is the process of analyzing as accurately as possible verbal or written propositions in the pursuit of the most generic notions. These notions exhibit the texture of ontological propositions. The system thereby facilitates not a representation but an appeal to the facts. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to slow down and really take him at his word for a lot of the technical choices he uses. Okay, so these notions, they are finally generic in the logical sense, I think, of being non-derivative and mutually implicative or definable in terms of each other and therefore logically simple. I'm trying to understand these, these generic notions in terms of what he says about primary ideas in the Principia. Generic notions only mean insofar as they function to contribute determination. So to function is defined uh, in process and reality as well as in the Principia as a con contribution of determination to other notions. It is a fundamental assumption of Whitehead's um, in the Principia that, quote, a function can only appear in a matrix through its values. This sounds like the logical version to me of the ontological principle, that a function is not recognizable apart from the actualities whose determinateness exhibit it. It is significant then that Whitehead makes explicit his understanding of his speculative scheme in process and reality as a matrix. He writes, the scheme is a matrix from which true propositions applicable to particular circumstances can be derived. The use of such a matrix is to argue from it boldly and with rigid logic. The truth function of a proposition is derivable from, because relative to, a system of ideas. But that system itself facilitates the appeal to the facts, not individual propositions. To call the scheme a matrix is therefore to deny that the philosophic truth achieved by the scheme is a matter of direct representation between its notions or propositions and things and facts. The utility of the scheme is realized only insofar as it approximates adequate self-expression. What the scheme enables is the expression of general truths whose status as such is lost when any one is taken as an adequate expression of the facts, that is, or ontic propositions. Linguistic expression of ontic propositions or ontological propositions never finally express them. Taking linguistic propositions to express metaphysical ones is a pragmatic self-contradiction. He writes, the true propositions which they do express lose their fundamental character as such as true when subjected to adequate expression. 
in subject predicate form of statement, as I understand him to be indicating. Language is by its very nature indeterminate. It cannot enunciate well-defined propositions because each enunciation, each occurrence of language is conditioned, presupposing, he says, some systematic type of environment. It can only express those presuppos presuppositions and thereby produce perspectives. A perspective is only achieved by coherence and consistency. Its worth, what we might call its truth, is, is measured by how it facilitates the self-disclosure of experience. It is for this reason that Whitehead says it is not a valid criticism of a metaphysical system to show that, quote, its doctrines do not follow from the verbal expression of the facts accepted by a different system. The issue is only ever about the extent to which those doctrines, quote, supply a closer appro approach to fully expressed propositions. Adequate expression is not the same as adequate representation. What metaphysical statements try to express are the general ideas presupposed by facts of experience. <clears throat> and therefore, the measure of their adequacy is elucidation, not representation of that experience. General ideas are always exemplified, never observed. Strict induction, or what he says, or calls rigid empiricism, will never divulge them. Philosophic generalization, when partially successful, quote, will enlighten observation in remote fields of application so that general principles can be discerned in the process of illustration, which in the absence of an imaginative generalization are obscured by their persistent exemplif exemplification. That was a quote from Whitehead. Philosophical truth is, it sounds to me, constructed. It is achieved in part by demanding the mutual implication of first principles, the ideal of coherence, and the avoidance of contradiction or logical consistency. The formal importance of a rational system in the sense of its pervasiveness grows in proportion to its formal elegance in the sense that <clears throat> Its primitive ideas and principles are, as Whitehead says, few and simple. But rational construction is, quote, productive of important knowledge, what he calls important knowledge, only insofar as more critical empiricism is thereby aided by it. The construction should disclose the character of reflective experience. Its capacity to do so is measured by the extent to which it resolves problems in our ability to conceive or in account for experience. The problem of principal concern for Whitehead was the problem of mereness that I mentioned earlier. Misplaced concreteness, for instance, is a problem because it makes real togetherness inconceivable. Inconceivability is a goal is the problem. Conceivability is a goal. He says, philosophical thought has made for itself difficulties by dealing exclusively in very abstract notions, such as those of mere awareness, mere private sensation, mere emotion, mere purpose, mere appearance, mere causation. These are the ghosts of the old faculties, banished from psychology, but still haunting metaphysics. There could be no mere togetherness of such abstraction. Mereness is therefore a technical term, signal, signaling uh, an inadequate set of primary notions. Mere notions are abstractions that have not been properly generalized. Whitehead replaces uh, these primary notions that he finds problematic with ones like actual entity, preemption, nexus, in order precisely to preempt the problem of their togetherness. <clears throat> These primary notions are modeled on what Whitehead calls primitive ideas in the Principia. We understand their speculative function without appreciation of their formal function at, uh, for Whitehead as indefinables. Whitehead says in the Principia, their primitiveness is only relative to our exposition of logical connection and is not absolute. Though, of course, such an exposition gains in importance according to the simplicity of its 
primitive ideas. The primitive ideas in the Principia designate the fundamental functions of propositions. These fundamental functions are the contradictory function, disjunctive function, conjunctive function, and implicative function. What makes them important is that they serve as the basis for all deduction. All other propositions are subordinate ones. Primitive ideas are few and simple. They are also mutually implicative. If two of them are taken as primitive, undefined ideas, the other two can be defined in terms of them. Likewise, in process and reality, Whitehead says that the metaphysical first principles can never fail of exemplification, at least without, not without ceasing to be first principles. So it's not their independence but that makes them primitive, it's precisely their lack of independence, but their simplicity, their elegance. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to um, skip a little bit. That's beautiful, thank you. So the whole point for Whitehead in process and reality is to account for creative advance, right? For the advance from disjunction to conjunction, creating a novel entity uh, other than the entities in the initial disjunction. The possibility of novelty is the possibility of a novel togetherness of the disjunctive many that become one among the many. Whitehead terms the production of novel togetherness a concrescence, as we know, and designates it <clears throat> as an ultimate notion. But again, these ultimate notions are uh, ultimate only with respect, as we've just established, to the scheme it itself. Language is imprecise in principle. Language is thoroughly indeterminate, he says, by reason of the fact that every occurrence presupposes some systematic type of environment. Language functions qua imprecise because meaning is matrixial. But for the same reason, it can be generative of a new quality of perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm skipping forward. Okay, so now, <clears throat> the mandate of philosophy, according to Whitehead, is to recover the totality obscured by selection, right? The service of its generic notions to consciousness is to make it easier to conceive the infinite variety of specific instances which rest unrealized in the womb of nature. The rational scheme produces a cosmological story the fullness of which is imminent no matter where one begins within it. To conceive by way of generic notions is to attempt to contract the communicable universe as systematically presupposed in reflective experience. I said that this paper became one about God. Unfortunately, I don't quite have the time to, to address that portion yet, but I will say briefly that the final interpretation right, of the scheme in terms of the God world contrast, gives us an excellent attempt or an excellent opportunity to understand the way in which Whitehead saw himself to be telling the truth. Because if we do not allow that, that contrast to finally dissolve itself, to disclose the nature which has no other, if we let it be a, a, a final set of oppositions, right, then we have completely missed his point. Right, which is to say that God, the God world contrast can be true, but not insofar as it's representative, right? But in terms of its, its function to dissolve itself, to render conceivable what he says is the infinite variety of possible experience resting in the womb of nature. So I'm gonna conclude there um, and leave the rest to possible questions. <clears throat>